So a few months ago, I watched this movie that I thought was so hilarious. And at the time, I really wanted to make a video about it, but it was a big studio movie and I was trying not to cover struck media during the writers and actors strikes, so I kind of forgot about it. But now those strikes are both over and I'm planning a big video for December that might not be out for a while. So I thought it might be good to make a fun, short video revisiting this weird movie I watched this summer. The movie in question is called Urban Legends Final Cut. This is a sequel to the movie Urban Legend from 1998. So there's our first strange element, right? The first movie was called Urban Legend, and this one is called Urban Legends, plural, colon, Final Cut. I did watch the first Urban Legend first, and I'd say it's a pretty okay movie. It didn't get very good reviews when it first came out, and I'm not sure why. It's a perfectly competent, well-made slasher movie. Looking at some of the contemporary reviews, it looks like some critics accused it of just being a Scream ripoff, and I find that kind of silly. For one thing, even if it was a Scream ripoff, I don't think that's necessarily a reason to write it off entirely. Like, if it's good, then does it really matter? But also, I recently wrote my thesis paper on the slasher genre, so I've actually read a lot of scholarship on slasher movies, and I would be more inclined to say that these are just both movies belonging to a certain wave of the slasher genre. Most scholars define the golden age of the slasher film as lasting from around the mid-1970s to around the early 1980s. But then there's another notable period beginning in the early 1990s that we call the postmodern slasher era. Postmodern period slasher films are self referential and metatextual in nature. They're aware of the genre's existence and play on that idea. No, please don't kill me, Mr. Ghostface. I want to be in the sequel. The two defining films of this era's inception are Wes Craven's New Nightmare and Scream. And when it comes to urban legend, it very well could have been just trying to profit off of the success of Scream, but I feel it's also fair to say that it was just following the natural evolution of the genre into this more metatextual space, in this case drawing on folkloric tradition. That being said, if you do watch it, trigger warning, it has Jared Leto in it. Anyway, the sequel, Urban Legends Final Cut, has very little to do with the original film in terms of continuity. The only returning character is this campus security guard played by Loretta Devine, and it basically just recycles the plot of the first film. Where the first urban legend followed a string of murders based on popular urban legends being committed at the fictional Pendleton University, Urban Legends follows a string of murders based on popular urban legends being committed at the fictional Alpine University, this time a film school. I was very excited to see that this movie was set in film school, partly because you know that means it's going to be filled with baby's first film history class level cinema references, but more so because I just graduated from a film program, so I was pumped to see how realistic or unrealistic it might be. One of the other fun things about watching this movie now, with hindsight, is that it has a surprisingly star-studded cast and crew. The film stars Jennifer Morrison as our protagonist Amy, you probably know her from either House or Once Upon a Time, and it also has Warner from Legally Blonde as Travis Stark, the best filmmaker in the class. I know this guy was also on The Vampire Diaries, but I haven't seen The Vampire Diaries, so to me, he is Warner from Legally Blonde. Ava Mendez is in it, playing a lesbian character. And honestly, this is such a flagrant waste of a lesbian character played by Ava Mendez. She's barely in it, and the lesbian thing is usually played in a gross male gaze kind of way. Hi, dollface. Can I give you a lift? You already have. But there's this scene late in the film when the killer has left Ava Mendez a fake note from Amy saying that Amy's always secretly been in love with Ava Mendez to lure her up to the campus bell tower to murder her. You'd be surprised how big a role this campus bell tower plays in the movie. The bell tower was a paid actor. So Amy finds her there and Ava's like, I can't believe you left me this note. I got your note. I mean, at first I was a little surprised, but you know, not really. And Amy has to break it to her that she actually didn't write this note. Vanessa, I, I didn't write a letter. 
and then the killer shows up and kills Ava Mendez. But this whole sequence prompted me to imagine this alternate universe in which this movie was a lesbian love story between Jennifer Morrison and Ava Mendez, and I just want to say, I think we were robbed. Are you sure? Yeah, I got it. All right. I'll talk to you later. Good night. Bye. Anyway, there's also Anthony Anderson as one of the comic relief characters. Let's go play hopscotch. <laughs> His buddy in the movie, the other comic relief character, is not that famous as an actor, but apparently co-wrote Scott Pilgrim, so that feels notable. And Joey Lawrence is also in it, but honestly, I don't really know anything about the Lawrence brothers, I just know that they're famous. I didn't watch Brotherly Love. I was born in the year 2000 just like this movie. And then there's the crew. This movie was directed by John Ottman, one of the only films he's ever directed. You're more likely to recognize him as a film editor and composer. Most famously, he's edited most Brian Singer films. In recent years, you might recall that Ottman won the Academy Award for Best Editing for my least favorite movie of all time, Bohemian Rhapsody. This was controversial at the time because to many viewers, Bohemian Rhapsody seemed like one of the worst edited films of the year, if not of all time. Can I borrow it for Sunday church? So this is Queen. I've actually come to forgive Ottman for this a little bit though, because of course, part of the cursed mythos of Bohemian Rhapsody is that it switched directors halfway through filming, and this was after it had already been in development hell for several years. So to be absolutely fair to Ottman, I think his Oscar win was perhaps not so much a trophy for producing the best edited film of the year, as it was a consolation for managing to salvage the biggest disaster of the year. Anyway, the screenwriters of the film are also notable. This film was written by Scott Derrickson and Paul Harris Boardman. These two have collaborated on a number of films directed by Derrickson, who is now a famous director and writer. This was one of his very first projects. Some of Derrickson's films are pretty well regarded. He did The Exorcism of Emily Rose, Sinister, they had him direct Doctor Strange for some reason, and most recently he made The Black Phone, which I think people liked. So all in all, Urban Legend's final cut is just bursting with burgeoning talent. A lot of the people in it or involved in making it are like one or two projects away from being established stars. And in a way, I think you can feel that energy. For a theoretically cynical horror sequel, it really has a beating heart. At first, when I set out to make this video, I thought I would approach it as a so bad it's good movie, but upon rewatching, there was a moment, maybe about a third of the way through, where I had to stop and say to myself, wait a minute, is this movie kind of good? It's not amazing, but I feel like most of it is pretty well executed, and the silly parts of the plot only serve to improve the viewing experience. The film follows Amy Mayfield, a film student and daughter of a famous fictional documentarian, as she begins production on her thesis film, a horror suspense movie based on the in-universe events of the previous film, a serial killer whose murders are based on urban legends. Of course, as soon as she starts shooting, people begin to actually die at the hands of this murderer who wears a fencing mask. So first, let's talk about the film school setting and resulting film references. There are definitely a lot of allusions to classic horror cinema in the movie. Early on, we have this Twilight Zone reference in the film within a film that one of the students is shooting. Except in that movie, they had this, like, creature on the wing of the plane. Then there's what I think is supposed to be a nod to Black Christmas in this one girl's death scene. This character's death scene is clearly paying homage to Michael Powell's Peeping Tom. And the whole movie has a very ham-fisted basis in Hitchcock films, with all of the film student characters vying for the school's prestigious Hitchcock Award. At the end of the semester, you may submit your thesis films 
to be considered for the prestigious Hitchcock Award. Most of the film and industry references are pretty on the nose. It feels a little dumbed down. However, it is still funny to see, say, a film professor feel the need to explain what mise-en-scene is to another film professor. On the other hand, it could be argued that mise-en-scene or staging are two examples that are basically mutually exclusive. So I did enjoy any time the film included any film talk that felt a little more specific or opinionated. Digital sucks, man. Latex rules. That's not what your god George Lucas says. Yeah, well, fuck George Lucas. It's funny to see what industry discourse was hot 23 years ago. And there actually were a couple film school things in the movie that I found rather relatable. For one, I really genuinely appreciated how the behavior of all the douchebag guys in Amy's class had these real undertones of misogyny, because that is very accurate to my film school experience. Nobody is gonna steal the Hitchcock from me. Especially you, little girl. I'll see you on the set. Darling. Like, don't get mad at me, but yeah, these people in your film class who think they're better than everyone else and accuse everybody else of stealing their ideas and feel entitled to the best equipment, the best resources, whatever, they're usually men who hate women. Knowing that the movie was made by men and that it's a little old, I was pleasantly surprised by their portrayal of this type of guy. I also liked that one of the film professors is this dry theory teacher and the other is the practical Hollywood type guy who finds the theory teacher boring because that is also realistic to my experience. Like in a bad way. I was really frustrated at my school's treatment of the theory teachers in my course. Sometimes you have one teacher who clearly looks down on people who do theory instead of practical filmmaking. I'm looking at you, Julian. What do you have against books? Anyway, now let's talk about all the things in this movie that don't make any sense. So first off, it's a small thing, but I find it really funny that the killer's trademark in this movie is a fencing mask, and we just never find out why. There's no reason given that he wears this fencing mask. It would be one thing if his mask or getup was somehow related to film, but it's not. It's just a fencing mask, and it's never explained. I really don't understand the timelines of the thesis projects in this movie. Like, these characters are all in the same class, but at the beginning of the film, some students have already shot and in some cases edited their entire film, while others have not even begun to write their script. So I don't get that. In fact, some of you have yet to submit your screenplays. I can't speak for all film courses, but in mine, in our final year when we were working on our thesis films, there were shared deadlines throughout the year to make sure everyone was on track. Like one deadline for when your script had to be finished, one deadline for your previs, one deadline for your first rough cut, etc. But here, they're all in different stages of production somehow. Finally, it's kind of funny how little this film actually has to do with urban legends. Yes, Amy's thesis film is sort of a meta pastiche of the first urban legend film, but the actual murders that take place in the movie are not based on urban legends. They're just regular slasher kills. And because the urban legend motif only really exists within Amy's film, by the last third of the movie or so, they kind of just forget about it because Amy's not actively producing her movie anymore. And when the killer is unmasked, we'll get to that in a minute, he says that he took Amy's film as the perfect opportunity to conceal his crimes and frame Amy for the murders. But like, his murders aren't based on urban legends. So how and why would anyone believe they were even related to Amy's film? Whatever, now let's talk about the funniest part of the movie. So truth be told, I don't really care that much about the first four-fifths of Urban Legends Final Cut. They're fine, but what I really want to tell you about are approximately the last 20 minutes. Following the death of Ava Mendez, Amy and Trevor 
I should probably explain this. Okay, in the movie, Warner from Legally Blonde plays Travis Stark, the genius of the class, who has apparently made an incredible thesis film called The Gods of Men. But to his confusion and disappointment, when he turns it in, he gets a bad grade. C fucking minus. And then the next day, Travis Stark turns up dead. The police say that he killed himself, but of course that's not what happened. He was killed by the killer. The killer. He's the killer. The killer is everywhere. So then a day or two later, a guy that looks exactly like Travis shows up and he explains to Amy that he is Trevor Stark, Travis's twin brother. I'm Trevor Stark. Yeah. I'm his brother. So anyway, at this point in the film, 20 minutes before the end, Trevor and Amy realize that everyone who's been killed so far worked on Travis's film, The Gods of Men. And then they actually sit down and watch the movie, and it's really bad. That was just awful. How could Travis make such a shitty movie? This is so funny to me. The entire resolution to our mystery hinges on these two just not buying that their buddy Travis could have made a movie this bad. This is basically where the movie starts to feel like a comedy. So they deduce that someone has taken the credits of Travis's film and swapped them with their own to pass his film off as their own, and then presumably killed Travis and everyone else who worked on the film to cover their tracks. They realize that the only person left who worked on Travis's film and hasn't been killed is their douchebag classmate, Toby. So they assume that the killer is Toby and they kidnap him at gunpoint. They call in their professor, Professor Solomon, to come witness Toby's confession. Professor Solomon, uh, uh, listen, uh, could you talk to them? Because they have a gun and I think they're gonna- Shut up! Okay. okay, okay. This is kind of unhinged, right? <laughs> like maybe get a confession first and then call in the faculty member after you've put the gun away. Anyway, Toby surprises everyone by saying that he didn't actually work on Travis's film at all. He just got Travis to say that he did so that he could get graded for it without doing the work. No, I did not do the sound on your film, you fake suicide psycho. Professor Solomon is disturbed by this. This is how he responds. You realize what this means, don't you? What? It means I gave you an A in sound for nothing. Okay, already we're off to an incredible start here, but it's the moment right after this that really makes it. Film's a collaborative medium. And who the fuck are you? When I watched this for the first time, this moment was when I knew I loved this movie. I didn't mention this before because I didn't want to spoil it, but this was probably the moment that spoke the most deeply to my film school experience. In film school, you get these guys, yes, again, they're usually guys, who think that they can do everything by themselves. They think that they don't need to help anyone else with their films, and they think that they don't need anybody else's help on their films. And this usually goes exactly one way. They'll pitch their idea early on, and they're like, yeah, I'm planning to write, direct, shoot, and edit this movie by myself. And then a teacher usually tells them, that's a really bad idea, you definitely shouldn't do that. And then they are either forced by a teacher to scrap that idea and join a group, or more entertainingly, they insist on producing their one-man film and it goes just as terribly as you would expect, and the resulting film sucks, and you and your teacher get to laugh at them. So anyway, a character hearing that someone faked doing sound on another person's film, shooting them for it, and then saying film is a collaborative medium as their cool movie one-liner is maybe my favorite thing I've ever seen happen in a movie. I'm so obsessed. Obviously, following this, it's revealed that Professor Solomon is in fact the killer. He sounds like he's the killer. The killer is on the loose! And that when he was a student, he was up for the Hitchcock Award against another student. And Amy's dad, the famous documentarian, cast the deciding vote in favor of the other student. Your father robbed me of the career I should have had in Hollywood. And I've been trapped here ever since. 
And in Solomon's mind, this made him lose out on his one chance to enter the industry, relegating him to the pathetic job of mere film professor. Travis made a brilliant film. And I saw my way out. But when he saw Travis Stark's film, Gods of Men, he saw his opportunity to make it out. So he stole the film with the intention to pass it off as his own and frame Amy for revenge. Hey babe, whatever. Will you end up in some lesbo prison? I'll be heading to LA with Travis's film under my belt in a three picture deal. This movie is awesome. But here we have another thing that doesn't make any sense. First off, is he expecting that he will win the Hitchcock Award with this film? He's faculty. I'm pretty sure it's a student-only competition. But even if he's just planning to send it to festivals or whatever and make a name for himself that way, that implies that if he wanted to break into the industry all this time, he could have just made a film and released it. Film professors can do that. In fact, they do. Often. In fairness, though, he is a deranged killer who apparently didn't have the talent to win the Hitchcock in the first place, so maybe this is all a clever and intentional way to show that he never would have been able to make it on his own. I just thought it was funny that he would rather kill seven people and figure out how to frame someone for it than simply apply himself and try to make a decent short film of his own. You really did this the hard way, huh? The entire climax is amazing. Joey Lawrence ends up getting shot in the crossfire somehow. I kind of don't even understand how or why his character ended up here for this part. Maybe Joey's contract required more screen time. The whole scene takes place in the school's film studio, so we have all these funny set backdrops like an alien spaceship and a spooky graveyard. And at one point, Trevor crashes into this big crate of prop guns, and they all spill all over the floor, and now the characters can't tell which gun is the real gun, so they have this Russian roulette-style standoff. Dare I say, it's kind of like the climax of the movie Knives Out. Don't lie to me, Ryan Johnson. I know you got the idea from Urban Legend's final cut. But Loretta Devine and her Pam Greer-inspired gun end up saving the day, so all is well. At the very end of the movie, we see Professor Solomon is in a mental institution with a nurse who is the killer from the first urban legend. Whoa! All of the urban legend superfans in the audience must have gone crazy for that one. If I may return to the Pam Greer thing for one second, the film references her movies and Loretta Devine's character's love of them several times. That's my sister, baby. She's a whole lot of woman. And every time, I was just picturing this guy, Scott Derrickson, sitting at his word processor, writing these parts of the movie. I've always been partial to Foxy Brown. That's my sister, baby. And, and she's, she's a whole lot of woman. <laughs> this movie got really bad reviews when it was first released, and I just want to be the first to say that Urban Legends Final Cut was tragically misunderstood by critics. This movie is perfect, I love it, and it is long overdue for critical reappraisal. John Ottman should not have won an Oscar for Bohemian Rhapsody. He should have won an Oscar for this. It means I gave you an A in sound for nothing. 